Hi, everyone. Welcome to Legal Notes series of webinars for the Web3 founders. Um, before we start, I would like to kindly ask you to send plus to the chat in this webinar room to confirm that the connection is good and that you can see my screen and my slides well. That will help me to, to double check all technical matters. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, so I would like to welcome you again to our series of webinars where we will discuss uh, some legal matters and legal questions for the Web3 founders, especially when it comes to the legal structuring of these decentralized entities, decentralized vehicles. And I uh, hope it will be useful for you to navigate around this complex legal world, find more about the crypto-friendly countries, and uh, discover for yourself uh, which kind of legal structures might be used to create a proper legal wrappers for the decentralized uh, apps and for the decentralized autonomous organizations. Before we start, I would like to explain briefly the agenda for today's webinar. So we will split it into two parts. The first part will be more the content one where we will, um, where I'll provide you some brief introduction into the today's topic and we'll discuss a bit later uh, what will be included into this content part. And uh, it will take uh, around 20 to 30 minutes. And the second part we will spend for uh, questions and answers because uh, the topic is not simple and uh, I, I would like to um, in, invite you to our uh, webinar chat and um, kindly ask to send your questions uh, in case it will arise during the presentation. So we will cover it in the second part of our webinar. Our today's topic is about decentralized apps uh, legal structuring. And uh, uh, this is uh, not just a, a regular uh, topic of how to structure a venture-backed company. It's more about how to structure this new ownerless and permissionless concepts. And at the same time, to be able to raise venture uh, investments from the venture firms and uh, to protect the, uh, the interest and to, to also ensure uh, that all compliance matters are followed for the decentralized community of people who will participate in this in this depth. So that's our topic for today. And uh, I hope uh, you will find useful uh, uh, for, uh, for, your, for your projects and for your company's legal structuring. Before we start, I would like to also provide a brief introduction of myself and uh, of, uh, of the company which organized this webinar. My name is Nestor Dubnevich. I'm a co-founder of Legal Notes, uh, and I'm also an international legal specialist working with the Web3 and blockchain companies since uh, 2015. Uh, since that time, I conducted more than 100 legal sessions with the experienced Web3 founders where we discussed different countries and different regulatory frameworks which might be suitable for a Web3 project's legal structuring. At the same time, I, I'm also a contributor to the Legal Notes blog uh, or the Legal Notes Resource Center, where you can find more about the different legal concepts for DAO legal structuring and also some other le uh, legal, legally related matters on uh, uh, when it comes to Web3 projects legal structuring. And um, Speaking about the legal notes, uh, basically it's a company which uh, helps founders um, to solve their cross-border legal matters. And it, it's, it's especially relevant when it comes to the uh, Web3 three, web three field, because usually in this field, it's quite difficult to find the most suitable and crypto-friendly country and uh, it usually requires different legal structures in different countries simultaneously. Also, it's always important to get this local legal opinions. And uh, speaking about these uh, challenges and considering these challenges that the Web3 founders usually face, we developed a, a product which is a virtual legal officer 
basically it's a dedicated uh, international legal specialist who can help the Web3 founders to navigate around this complex legal world and also uh, who, who, will, who will be able to help to engage and facilitate the process of, uh, of the legal services provision with the local qualified legal providers when it comes to company registration in different uh, countries or obtaining legal opinions, tax advice, uh, tax advice, etc. Uh, so uh, you can find more about uh, about this solution and uh, about uh, d- different other uh, uh, and some other useful information from the legal web three on our website legalnotes.com. And uh, I would like to come back to our main topic and uh, pre- uh, make this very important disclaimer that uh, this presentation is not legal advice. That's um, a very important step for every uh, Web3, uh, sorry, for, for every legal presentation. So please uh, consider it as and use it just for the informational purposes. So uh, our main topic today is about decentralized apps legal structuring. And uh, before we start and before we discuss uh, the agenda for this uh, webinar, it's very important to uh, make a clear explanation of uh, what is the main difference between the Web2 and Web3 industries. And this is especially important for from the legal perspective, as we need to highlight the main challenges of this uh, new industry before we we'll, we will start the discussion on how to manage this uh, this main challenges. And when we speak about the Web2 industry, we can say that uh, it's more about centralized IT infrastructure, like uh, centralized hosting providers, domain registrators, and some other types of centralized databases. It's also about centralized ownership uh, when it comes to company registration. And uh, here we can speak about the share, share ownership structure where there are the shareholders who might be the founders, the investors, the employees, etc. And it's also about centralized management where we can say speak about the board of directors and the, uh, the meeting of shareholders, etc. So the, this whole concept of Web2 world is related to centralized ownership, management, and the centralized tech infrastructure for launching such projects. And uh, before, uh, sorry, until the blockchain technology uh, was invented, uh, this was the only solution for the tech founders. But since the blockchain technology was invented, the tech the tech industry made a drift to to the Web three area, where we can speak more about this concept of uh, decentralization and. Uh, about the ownerless and permissionless structures. And basically that results this Web3 industry, which we can discuss today, uh, which uh, has its own advantages uh, in comparison with the Web2 industry. So uh, among these advantages, we can highlight uh, a decentralized tech infrastructure for launching different apps and um, other uh, tech vehicles, especially um, it's especially relevant for our today's topic because today we will discuss the decentralized app apps legal structuring, and uh, these decentralized apps might live and work in this uh, decentralized blockchain networks without centralized hosting providers, servers, etc. Secondly, uh, there is some uh, difference between uh, Web2 and Web3 areas when it comes to the um, ownership structure. And uh, in the most of the uh, Web3 projects, we can say that this ownership uh, might be structured in the form of the tokens rather than the traditional shares. So that's also one of the difference. And the third, third difference that uh, which is very important to discuss uh, from the legal perspective is a decentralized management. And uh, that's especially relevant when it comes to the DAO and to, to the decentralized governance with the DAO constitutions and the DAO voting processes, etc. 
So um, again, that's uh, th that's possible today um, for, uh, because of the blockchain technology, will pro which provides this new philosophy and new infrastructure for the for different tech solutions and uh, uh, tech applications. But when it comes to the legal structuring of such kind of new decentralized projects, the most of the Web3 founders usually face these uh, challenges because um, the, re the regular traditional uh, structures which they used to use for their uh, Web2 companies will not work properly for the Web3 industry. And it will not be possible to register just a Delaware C Corp if the founders are based in the US or the UK limited company if the founders are based in the UK. Uh, the Web3 structure will require more sophisticated approach and uh, there are much more uh, questions that should be covered uh, from the legal side to make it a proper decentralized organization. And the lawyers are also, were also quite surprised about this new concept as uh, the existing legal solutions, existing legal structures uh, all, uh, have their own limitations. And uh, it's not always simple to find the solution which will uh, be um, uh, from, from, from which will from one side will uh, will be well established and from from other side will satisfy all the requirements and all the needs of this new web3 industry so to sum up this um, a quick intro into the main difference between web2 and the web3 i would like to provide you a brief agenda for our today's webinar the first question that I would like to discuss with you is about the main difference between on-chain and off-chain parts of the decentralized apps. And uh, we will discuss it in, uh, especially for the purposes of legal structuring and how it will affect the, uh, the legal uh, consequences and uh, what might be the, re the, the legal structures for each of these parts. Secondly, we will discuss the types of the companies which are usually included into the legal wrapper for the decentralized app. Uh, thirdly, we will discuss the crypto-friendly countries for each of these types of uh, companies. And uh, the last, as I mentioned at the start of our webinar, we will make this Q&A session and cover the questions from our uh, auditory. So uh, let's move forward. Um, if, when we start uh, the, um, um, the con conversation about the legal structuring of the Web3, the best way to understand some basic uh, ideas of how this new Web3 project might be structured is always easier to start from, the, um, from, from dividing the Web3 projects into two parts, the on-chain part and the off-chain part. Let's start from the on-chain part. And basically, when we speak about the on-chain part, we can uh, speak about the system of smart contracts, which uh, lives and works inside the blockchain network and doesn't require all this um, centralized tech infrastructure like hosting providers, servers, uh, different domain registrators, etc. And that's uh, that's the main advantage of the of the Web3 area, and uh, that's also the main uh, um, like differentiating factor of of the of the Web3 industry. And at the same time, that's one of the most important things when it comes to legal structuring, because we need to take into account that uh, this on-chain part is fully autonomous because the smart contracts might work without any involvement of some third parties, without any administrators, moderators, owners, etc. The smart contracts might act as the ownerless and permissionless online vehicles. And that's why this part um, is usually called as the decentralized app or uh, uh, as the autonomous, autonomous entity. But at the same time, 
there are some use cases where there is very important to have this interaction between the on-chain fully virtual and blockchain based world and the off-chain real world and such use cases include the uh, the team of uh, software engineers who will be able to develop the smart contracts and deploy it into the blockchain network it will also require the team who will develop the interfaces to the smart contracts as the end users should have some possibility to interact with this uh, smart contracts that's why some off-chain interfaces needed also uh, the most of web series projects um, uh, would like to fund uh, to start a fundraising process which means that they plan to attract investments from some on-chain uh, off-chain uh, players like venture firms or uh, uh, or investors or angel investors or some other um, types of off-chain entities and at the same time conduct a public and or private uh, token sale also when we speak about the governance of uh, this uh, on-chain part uh, we need to speak about the group of people who will be um, able to or who will be entitled to vote for some changes inside the on-chain uh, on chain part for example if it's necessary to change the commissions of smart contracts or if it's important to increase the size of the treasury and uh, uh, here we can speak about the DAO members about this voting process about the grants issue issues when it comes to spending the grant uh, the treasury of the DAO so all these use cases that are described on this slide they require this uh, interaction between the on-chain and the off-chain world and that's uh, that's also involves some off-chain players uh, which you can uh, uh, which you can see on this slide and among these players when we speak about the uh, smart contract development and technical support for the interfaces to it we can speak about the founders, the core team, the software engineers. When we speak about the fundraising and token issues and token sale, uh, we can speak about the investors and some uh, off-chain infrastructure, which is very important for every token issuance and token distribution, like uh, exchanges, wallets, etc. And when we speak about the governance and uh, about the voting process, it's very important to highlight the DAO members and the uh, grant recipients uh, who might receive the grants from the DAO treasury. So uh, to sum up this, um, this structure, we have two different worlds. The first one is fully decentralized virtual on-chain world where all the uh, depths and smart contracts exist and at the same time we have off-chain world where there are some off-chain market players who need to interact somehow with the on-chain part and it seems that there is some gap between these two worlds and uh, that's the main challenge especially for the legal structures and uh, uh, the end uh, the end goal for every legal structure for a web3 project is to build a clear clear bridges between the on-chain and the off-chain worlds to to be able to, to allow the uh, off-chain players to interact with this on-chain vehicle in a compliant way and according to all regulatory requirements that's why we can say that uh, the, the end goal for our today's uh, webinar is to understand how to build these proper bridges between these two worlds and how they might look like. And um, again, as I mentioned previously, these bridges are usually built in the form of specific legal entities, uh, which uh, uh, where each of these legal entity covers its own area of responsibility and covers its own use case. Uh, sorry, cover this uh, its own cases of interaction between the on-chain and the off-chain parts. And uh, among such entities, we can highlight the DAO company, 
which is basically the company which helps to develop the smart contracts, deploy them to the into the uh, blockchain network, and, and, uh, and that uh, there will be some level of technical support for the smart contracts and interfaces to them. And basically, this uh, Dell company usually uh, I- includes the founders, the software engineers, and uh, in some cases also publish the interfaces to the uh, on-chain part, to the smart contract. Second uh, type of company, which is also used as the bridge between the on-chain and the off-chain parts, is the token company. And uh, this company covers all cases uh, of uh, interaction between the on-chain and off-chain worlds which are related to tokens. Uh, We can speak about the token sale. Uh, If there is a private token sale, we can speak also about the fundraising, where uh, there is not just an equity fundraising, but also the token fundraising, where the tokens are involved in these investment documents and should be issued in the future for the investors. We can also speak about the token launch in different launch pads or token listing in different wallets and exchanges. That's also the cases of interaction between on-chain and off-chain worlds. And uh, that's the case where it's very important to have this proper legal bridge between these two worlds. And the third type of the company is a DAO company, which is uh, the legal bridge between the on-chain part and the group of or the community of people who will be involved in a decentralized ownership and decentralized uh, governance of the on-chain part. And here we can speak about the DAO, which has its own DAO constitution, where uh, it's clearly described the process of voting and of uh, decision-making and where each of DAO member can uh, publish the proposal and uh, suggest other DAO members to vote for it and to ensure that this uh, governance and this DAO management will be structured in a fully decentralized way. So that's three types of uh, legal entities that are usually used as the bridges between the on-chain and the off-chain worlds and uh, which uh, which helps to uh, the the off-chain world to interact with the on-chain entities, which are again, decentralized, ownerless and permissionless. Let's discuss a bit more each of these companies. When we start, uh, as we started uh, from the Dell company, which is basically a software development company, or in some structures, it's also might call an operating company or a development laboratory. That's basically the company which usually covers uh, the most operating matters. Every project starts from the initial uh, software development. And uh, this is the same for the Web3 industry. Uh, So uh, the founders usually start from hiring the group of software engineers and some other core team members. And uh, for these purposes, they need the company, which will uh, cover all this uh, hiring and payroll matters. At the same time, the company, which will uh, pay for all subscriptions, which are necessary for creating this environment for software development, uh, etc. So that's that's all the tasks, that that's all the area of responsibility for the Dell company. And in the end, this Dell company usually acts as the intellectual property owner, as uh, this company hires software engineers and uh, get all uh, uh, intellectual property that was developed, so uh, including the source code, the design, probably some databases, etc. So that's the main idea of this first company: the operating matters and the uh, intellectual property uh, and and holding of the intellectual property. Secondly, we can speak about the token company. And uh, as was mentioned before, the main idea of token company is to create a proper bridge between the on-chain and the off-chain worlds uh, when it comes to the token-related cases. And among such token-related cases, we can highlight the fundraising, 
as uh, in the Web3 industry, this fundraising might be uh, uh, might be structured with the involvement of the tokens. So we can speak about the SAFTs, which is a simple agreement for future tokens. We can speak about the SAFTs, which is a simple agreement for future equity and tokens, where the investors will receive both equity and tokens in the future. Or we can speak even about the token transfer or token sale agreements where the tokens uh, will be transferred to the investors for some amount of funds. Secondly, uh, it's also very important to discuss the token listing because um, if, you, if we speak about, uh, about some centralized uh, crypto exchanges, each of them will have its own listing policy and listing agreement. And uh, this listing agreement should be signed with, with the legal entity from the project side. So this token company will act as this uh, anti legal entity which will sign a token uh, listing agreement and go through this uh, token list token onboarding and listing procedure. And uh, if you speak about the token distribution, especially when it comes to the some uh, distribution of tokens for the employees, like token options, or for advisors, or for uh, for the founders or even for some airdrop campaigns or for some other campaigns where the tokens are distributed among communities. Uh, here, uh, it also will be very important to have a proper legal entity which will cover this process and which will be mentioned in the uh, public uh, policies and the offers uh, for, of such campaigns. And this token company will cover all these matters. The third company, a type of the company, is a DAO company. And basically, this DAO company covers uh, all matters related to the DAO membership, uh, uh, including the confirmations of DAO membership for, uh, uh, for each DAO member, whether it will be the governance token or the LP tokens or some other kind of membership tokens. Also, this company covers the voting process where the uh, that the, the DAO members are entitled to vote for some decisions, to publish some proposals, and to organize all this decentralized governance process. And uh, in case the DAO plan to spend some part of its uh, treasury to, to fund some uh, project from the ecosystem, that's also the matter which is covered by the DAO company. And this DAO company ensures that all compliance matters were followed and uh, uh, that the grant might be properly sent from the DAO treasury to this ecosystem project. The second uh, question that uh, the founders usually need to solve is to understand where they can register these companies and how these companies might be link between each other and how, how they can interact between each other and whether it's it's necessary to do this and uh, when we speak about the countries uh, which might be the most suitable one for registering each of types of these companies we need to uh, clearly define the most important criteria for each of these companies when we speak about the dev company the most important criteria uh, for choosing the country for such DAO core registration is first the location of the core team as it will be more convenient to hire people pay them salaries and uh, cover some other operating matters like uh, renting office etc in the country uh, from the company which is registered in the country where the core team is based and at the same time it's very important to uh, check whether this country is IP uh, slash IT friendly, whether there are any IT related tax allowances, whether there are some specific tax regimes for, for the tech businesses, whether uh, there is a good uh, regulatory framework for IT, IP protection, for trademarks and patents registrations, etc., etc. So that's two main criteria for uh, choosing the countries for dev core registration. When we speak about the token core registration, it's very important first to understand uh, what is the legal status of the token, because some types of the tokens 
um, um, might might require uh, the jurisdictions uh, which have specific frameworks for, their, for, for for some specific types of the tokens. For example, if, if, if the company plans to issue and distribute the security tokens, it's necessary to consider the countries uh, which already have developed this uh, regulatory frameworks for security tokens, the same with the utility tokens, the same with the payment tokens. So it's very important to clearly define the legal status of the token and then to check which country provides the most flexible regulatory framework specifically for such a kind of, uh, of token. Then it's very important to define the token distribution plan whether the token will be distributed privately or there, whether there will be some public token sale or whether the company plan to distribute tokens through some third party platforms like launchpads or exchanges. This will also have some specific legal consequences in different countries as some countries might require uh, the KYC procedures for public token sale activities. Some of them might require the, uh, to, to obtain some specific as a crypto related authorization for conducting public token sale, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also the question, which is very important to you, the criteria, which is very important to take into account when choosing the country for token co-registration. And the third criteria is the investor investors requirements as some of the web three funds also have their own, uh, requirements which country uh, they can accept and which one they cannot so it, it's highly recommended for the web three founders to check it with the with the investors whether they can accept, accept uh, some specific countries where the token call will be registered and when we speak about the dao company first of all it's very important to to define which kind of dao will be launched whether it will be the community DAO, the service DAO, the investment DAO. And in case you are interested in this topic, uh, please follow our social media and register on our next webinars as the sixth one will be about these different types of DAO and how they might be structured. Secondly, uh, what is the DAO membership model, whether the DAO will issue a governance tokens or uh, community tokens or membership tokens, and what will be the status of these tokens in the country where the DAO company is registered. And also what is the governance model, how the voting process will be structured and uh, which kind of uh, governance bodies will be incorporated into the DAO, whether there will be some supervisors, guardians, treasurers, probably some board of advisors, etc. All these matters are super important when it comes to DAO company registration. On this slide, you can see a brief uh, overview of some uh, crypto friendly countries for each specific type of the companies. When we speak about the DAO company, it might be Delaware in the US, the UK, Singapore, the Estonia, again, uh, and IP and IT friendly countries and uh, the countries where the core team is based. The, token uh, the countries for the token company registration might include Switzerland, Singapore, Hong Kong, Cayman Islands, and some other countries where there are token gui legal guidances or where there are the regula clear regulatory frameworks for token issuance and token distributions. And for DAO company, it's uh, there is a common approach to, to consider some trust-based legal entities. Uh, including uh, the foundations, the LLCs, uh, the foundation company, if you speak about the Cayman. And uh, this, these types of the legal entities uh, help the Web3 founders to achieve this concept of ownerless and decentralized entities. And that's especially relevant when it comes to the decentralized governance and decentralized voting process. So that's uh, that's all for the content part for today. Hope uh, it was useful for you. And uh, I'm really happy to invite you to our next webinars where we will be able to cover more questions related to intellectual property for uh, decentralized apps. Also the Web3 products, legal structuring when it comes to uh, wallets, changes, 
different play to earn and move to earn uh, games and some other social file platforms. The, uh, the other webinars will, will include the topics about the tokenomics and legal structuring of token issuance and token distribution, the fundraising for Web3 projects, and in the end, the legal structuring of DAO. So you are very welcome to register on this next webinars. Uh, we will be very happy to meet with you there. And um, uh, I would like to also invite all of our today's attendants to book the call in case you have some uh, questions related to the depth legal structuring where we will be happy to discuss with you these matters in one one to one session and uh, try to find the best solution uh, on the market when it comes to, uh, to the web three legal structuring. So that's all for the content part. Thank you again for your attention. And I can see some questions in our chat. So I would like to thank you for this uh, as well. And uh, we'll try to cover some of them in the next couple of minutes. So the first question is uh, the question uh, related to the relationship between the uh, between the entities and it sounds like which of these companies is the top core to issue equity? That's the good question and we will cover it in more details on our webinar about the intellectual property with, which will be the next one and also on the webinar about the fundraising in Web3. In the most of the cases this um, dev core as this is an owner of the intellectual property of the project, is the company which issues shares. And that's also the company which uh, is usually used as the company for this combined fundraising where the investors are interested not just in tokens, but also in equity. So this company issues shares to the founders, to probably some share options to the employees, advisors, and it might issue the shares for the investors in the future. But uh, during the process of the project, Web3 project development, the founders uh, will need to build a clear strategy on what they plan to capitalize in, in their Web3 company. Because if it will be the tokens, this equity, this equity might not be the, the main uh, uh, asset of the, of the Web3, Web3 project. And uh, this uh, this shares might might not be relevant or interesting for the for the founders and for the investors in the future. However, in case both equity and tokens will be important for the company capitalization in the future, uh, it definitely be very important to uh, define the company which will cover this equity fundraising and issue the shares and uh, separately create the structures for the token issues. The next question is related is the following: How do we keep the member list um, in sync with the local is the local company register? Given security token users could come and go into high frequency. So um, speaking about the um, register of the uh, DAO members. That's again the question which we will cover on our webinar related to the DAO legal structuring. Uh, but uh, as we as we mentioned, a few uh, existing structures um, for uh, creating a DAO company, uh, some of them requires the uh, DAO DAO membership list. Some of them allows to do to make it fully on chain where the DAO members are entitled to join the DAO just to link their uh, blockchain wallets and uh, stake some tokens or receive some uh, governance tokens uh, in exchange. So uh, it, it's very important first to understand uh, what will be the uh, type of the DAO because there will be more requirements for the investment DAO and less requirements for the uh, community DAO. And uh, secondly, uh, it will depend on the country where this DAO company will be registered, as uh, in some countries uh, there are more requirements for the uh, DAO members register, 
in, in, in other countries, uh, it might uh, there is more flexibility to to do this. Um, the the next question is so there are three main types of web three structures and then each main uh structure has its own sub substructure um if i correctly un understood the question um the the question is related to the to the relationship between this uh, two types of entities uh, which uh, we discussed on the webinar and if yes, then uh, it's very important to say that uh, all this uh, type, all these three types of uh, legal entities or legal structures, they are uh, they um, create uh, they they create a legal wrapper for the on-chain part of the project. So basically, they are built around the on-chain part, and um, each of this company has its own uh, like tasks its own area of responsibility or its own cases that this company should cover to create this bridge between the on-chain and the off-chain parts and uh, that's uh, that's the, uh, the the way how these companies usually work uh if you speak about the substructures uh if if if, if, if it means that uh, the uh, founders might need some subsidiaries for example, for the Dell company, it's very common that uh, if the Web3 company grow and uh, grows and uh, becomes bigger, there might be not just one Dell company, but uh, a few one, or even the network of Dev shops, which will help the market participants to develop some uh, solutions uh, using the blockchain protocol. So um, there might be some subsidiaries in the future for, for the Dell company. But when we speak about the um, token company and the DAO company, it's uh, like a rare case to, to create the subsidiaries. But in some cases, it might be relevant. So it's more like a case by case basis question. Uh, the next question is about the utility or payment token issue in Ukraine. Uh, so that's the good question. And uh, if you speak about the token issuance and token distribution, um, it's very important to define in which country it will be the most convenient and most suitable to register the company which will issue and distribute the tokens. And it's highly recommended to do this in the country which uh, have already passed some specific uh, legislation uh, in this area. Speaking about Ukraine, uh, there is some specific uh, crypto-related legislation uh, but from um, from what I know, uh, it, it uh, covers um, more like uh, uh, crypto exchanges and crypto wallet services and regulates some uh, com uh, financial compliance matters. And I'm not sure whether the red it has a clear uh, definitions of payment and utility tokens and uh, how it might be issued. And also another important moment uh, is that this. Um, new legislation uh, has not uh, come into force uh, uh, as uh, the uh, tax legislation uh, was not passed uh, has not been passed yet so that's another reason why it might there might be some regulatory uncertainty for token issuance and token distribution there um so um yeah um let me uh, answer on uh, one to another questions, and uh, I think that um, we will uh, we will be closer to to the end of this um, webinar. And uh, another question is that if your token has both utility and security features, is it possible or should we be creating two tokens? Well, it's uh, this is the possible way uh, of structuring it, as uh, these two types of tokens usually um, has uh, two different ways of, uh, of, of regulation. Uh, the utility tokens uh, have more flexibility in some countries. The security tokens will have more restrictions in terms of its issuance and distribution, which means that for the convenience and for some compliance matters, it, it might be better to divide these different types of the tokens into the different tokens inside the tokenomics of the project and uh, issue and distribute it separately 
probably even through separate legal structures. Uh, another question is, um, could we use a protected cell structure to nest different SPVs with each one to issue its own security tokens to reduce having to create multiple entities? Well, uh, that's, that's also the good idea. And thank you very much for this question. Uh, it, it's especially, it might be especially relevant when it comes to the investment DAO and uh, there are some existing um, private investment fund structures in some of the countries where it's possible to split the, these funds into different cells, not to create a lot of uh, entities, but rather to create some separate cells. Uh, it, it will be very important to check uh, whether this uh, private investment funds or legislations might also cover the virtual assets and uh, the security tokens. But in general, uh, it, the, the, this definitely might be an interesting approach for um, security token structuring um, and uh, for uh, approaching this, uh, this Web3 legal structuring at all. So um, thank you very much for uh, your attention, for your questions. I am really glad to see a lot of questions and uh, I'll be very happy to discuss it on one-on-one -on -one session. So please feel free to book it on, uh, uh, on our website, legalnotes.com or uh, through this QR code on the slide. Uh, I'll, I'm looking forward to see you uh, on our next webinars. So please feel free to register to join our next webinars. Hope it will be useful for you and uh, let's meet uh, a bit later on our next online events. Goodbye.